The title of my message tonight is From the Dust of the Earth. For thousands of years, there has been two worldviews. Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 1 is an incredible piece of scientific knowledge. It says that prior to the existence of time and space and matter, there was a creator, a transcendent creator who through his incredible power and knowledge, created the heavens and the earth, space, time, and matter. The other view is expressed by Carl Sagan in his book Cosmos, says the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. So you have the view that a transcendent, supernatural creator who existed before the universe created the earth, the universe, and its life forms. The atheistic or the materialistic worldview is that the universe is all there is. There is nothing outside the dimensions of space and time, and that everything that exists is a result of natural forces within the space time domain, as a result of billions of years of accidental circumstances, the galaxies, the earth, and its life forms arose without any interference of an extra dimensional supernatural being. In Genesis 2.7, it says this, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So there's two views on how man and the life forms on planet Earth got here. The first view, which I call the intelligent design uh, formula, says that matter combined with energy, combined with information, concepts, know-how, blueprints, biochemical expertise is what was necessary to produce living systems. And that, of course, is the creation worldview. The evolutionary formula for life basically says that matter plus energy plus chance chemistry, what some would call chance stochastic chemical processes, Acting over billions of years of time produced all of the life forms that we see on planet Earth. So those are the two worldviews. When we talk about living systems, living beings, we need to define a little bit some of the basic characteristics of living systems. What is the difference between you know, this pulpit and the person standing behind the pulpit? And there's actually some quite basic differences that we can look at that define living systems. First of all, living systems are able to process energy. They're able to take nutrients from the environment, utilize the energy from those nutrients to perform useful work. That's one of the defining characteristics of living systems. Secondly, living systems must have the ability to store information within their cellular structure. Information that is necessary for the uh, metabolism and the reproduction of the organism so that they can make copies of themselves and pass that information on to the uh, next generation. So storage and also retrieval of that information is necessary if you're going to make copies of yourself. So that's the second thing. And another thing that is quite unique to living systems is self-reproduction. No machine ever made by man has ever been able to make copies of itself. You'll never find two cars in the parking lot snuggled up next to each other overnight the next day producing little baby cars. It just doesn't happen. So living systems are capable of storing, uh, processing energy, using nutrient energy from the environment to help them stay alive, metabolize, reproduce themselves. They're able to store information within their cellular structure. The information is used to make copies of themselves. The information is used for metabolism. It's used for uh, repair of uh, injured structures. And, of course, they're able to self-reproduce. These are three characteristics which define living systems and separate them from inanimate, non-living structures. And when we talk about the origin of life... We're really talking about two different aspects, two different problems in the origin of life. Living systems are comprised of two main components. They're comprised of hardware, 
chemical hardware, and they're comprised of software. The hardware in living systems is made up of a number of very complex chemicals. Proteins is the most abundant chemical that is found in living systems. Proteins are strands of amino acids bonded end to end, and proteins function to provide the structures in your body, bones, teeth, hair, skin. They're also involved in metabolism. Enzymes which accomplish the chemical reactions in living systems are proteins. And they make up the majority of the what I call the chemical hardware in living systems. The second structure is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is a very complex molecule we'll look at in a moment that is the molecule that all living systems on Earth use to store the information necessary to produce all life forms on planet Earth. It's a very complex molecule. And that is critical to explain the origin of DNA and proteins if we're going to explain the origin of life using any uh, method, whether it's evolution or creation. RNA, ribonucleic acid, is a, another very complex molecule that the information from DNA is transferred to RNA, and then RNA then transfers the information for the production of proteins. We'll look at that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. And finally... In living cells, there needs to be an envelope surrounding the cell that holds all the materials inside and keeps it from oozing out into the environment. So this is what we would call the cellular hardware. This is a uh, photograph showing some proteins within the uh, cell wall on the surface and within the uh, cell wall of a living cell. In 1953, a major discovery was made by James Watson and Francis Crick. James Watson and Francis Crick were working for years to try to discover the structure of the DNA molecule, which is the molecule that stores all of the information in all of living systems on planet Earth. They won the Nobel Prize eventually for elucidating the structure of DNA, and this is a photograph of them. And what they found was that the DNA molecule is made up of four chemical bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And these four chemical bases are attached to a sugar molecule called deoxyribose. And long strands of deoxyribose with these bases form a structure that looks something like a ladder which has been twisted on itself. Two strands of DNA attached to each other by hydrogen bonds and twisted like a ladder, forming what is called a double spiral helix. This molecule is very tightly packed and wound up inside the cells of every living organism on Earth. And it stores the chemical instructions, the information necessary to produce hearts, lungs, eyeballs, brains, teeth, liver, kidneys, everything in every living system on Earth. DNA is compacted in the cells into what are called chromosomes within the nucleus of uh, our cells. Chromosomes are very tightly wound packages of DNA. This is a photograph of the, uh, this is actually an electron micrograph of the X chromosome in human beings. Very tightly packed, condensed portions of DNA molecules, what makes up these uh, chromosomes. Now, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, in order for an organism to make copies of itself, it needs to duplicate the DNA molecules. A single DNA molecule can reproduce itself into two DNA molecules in a very complex process involving approximately 20 protein enzymes. A single cell can make a copy of itself, approximately 6 billion nucleotides, in about 15 to 20 minutes. Now, 6 billion nucleotides is vastly more information found in your average uh, computer hard drive. And yet it copies itself with an accuracy which is greater than digital computers today. The information on the DNA molecule is then transferred to a molecule called RNA, as I mentioned, and then RNA ultimately results in the production of proteins. Now the interesting thing about the DNA molecule is to make copies of DNA, you need proteins. But you can't make proteins until you have DNA. And this is one of the fundamental paradoxes of life, is you can't have DNA until you've got proteins, but you, don't, you can't have proteins until you have DNA. And we'll look at that a little more carefully as we go along. Now, the cellular software is 
contained or stored by the DNA molecule. The DNA contains coded instructions for all of the structures in all the living systems on planet Earth. And these instructions are carried by the DNA molecule in a chemical fashion. It is stored digitally in a mathematical form. It can be evaluated with mathematical principles. The code is error correcting. When a DNA molecule makes a copy of itself, when one DNA molecule results in the production of two new DNA molecules, a protein goes along the edge of the DNA to feel for the proper structure. If it finds an incorrect building block, it removes the building block and puts the correct one back in so that you get a perfect replication of the DNA molecule. So the DNA code is digital and it's error correcting. And the information in the DNA molecule is redundant. There is more than one gene in the human cell for the production of insulin. There's, in some cases, multiple backup genes for very critical molecules within the genetic code. When the uh, space shuttle takes off, it usually has four computers on board. It has one main computer and three backup computers in case the other computers fail. The DNA molecule is the same in living systems. The information is redundant. There's multiple places in the genetic code where critical molecules are made, where the information is stored. And finally, information on the DNA molecule is overlapping. They have found segments of DNA where more than one protein can be produced from a single segment of DNA. Let me give an example, a way to think of this. There are fragments of DNA that have been discovered that produce, say, human insulin. Well, they've also found situations where that same segment of DNA that produces insulin might also produce an entirely different functional protein a little further down the line, but overlapping to produce something, say, like hemoglobin. So the information on the DNA molecule is digital, it's error correcting, it's redundant, and the information is overlapping. This is incredible. There is no computer system that uses information in this fashion. So that's a little bit brief about the, the hardware and the software. Now, the evolutionary worldview teaches that life arose by the process of spontaneous generation. That is, non-living chemicals, by chance, came together to form living systems on the earth in the distant past. Many people give credit to Charles Darwin for this concept, the idea that somewhere in a puddle chemicals came together by random chance, but it actually was proposed about 24 centuries before Darwin by a Greek philosopher by the name of Anaximander. He first proposed in the 6th century BC that life arose in mud as little microbes, and they then evolved over time into more and more complex uh, organisms. So Darwin actually ripped his uh, theory off from Anaximander about 24 centuries before. In the Middle Ages, people believed that microbes, bacteria, arose from broths, soups and broths, because they noticed that when you left soup out for a few days, that there were critters inside of it. And so they just assumed that the critters had evolved out of the primordial soup there on the kitchen, uh, in the kitchen and uh, arose to form bacteria. They also believed that rats arose from trash because they noticed that when you put the trash out, if you leave trash out for a few days, rats show up in the trash. And so rats spontaneously evolved out of trash. And of course they believed that fruit flies uh, arose from aging fruit because they notice when you leave fruit out for a few days, flies show up. So that's the concept of uh, spontaneous generation. Now, in the 1800s, this gentleman, Louis Pasteur, wanted to put to rest the idea that non-living chemicals, non-living things such as trash and broths could spontaneously generate uh, living systems. And so what he did was an elegant experiment where he took some uh, broths, chemical broths, and he boiled them to kill any microbes that might be in there. And he used a gooseneck or an S-shaped glass flask and put a little bit of cotton 
inside the, the tip. And he, as long as he left the cotton there and didn't break off the glass neck, no organisms were generated at all inside the broths. They remained sterile. However, if he broke off the neck, within a couple of days, organisms started growing inside the broths. And so he proved that spontaneous generation does not happen, that the organisms come from the air and they get into the broths. And he's credited with blowing away the notion of spontaneous generation, at least for a while. A few years later, Charles Darwin, in 1859, published his book, uh, The Origin of Species. And in his book, he proposed that, indeed, living systems did evolve from non-living systems in a body of water somewhere on planet Earth. Only he didn't believe that spontaneous generation occurred quickly. He believed it occurred over a long period of time. And he said in his book, it is often said that all the conditions for the first production of a living organism are now present, which could ever be present. But if we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc., present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. So Darwin basically proposed that a long time ago on planet Earth, there was a primordial goo that energy from various sources, lightning, sunlight, etc., acted on chemicals found in a body of water somewhere and gradually produced protein molecules, which then evolved further into full-blown living systems. Now, during the time of Darwin, they didn't know what DNA was. It hadn't been discovered yet. But they knew that living systems at least involved uh, protein. And they felt for a while, for over 100 years, that protein was the basis, the fundamental basis upon which living systems were built. It wasn't until Watson and Crick, about 100 years later, that they discovered that there was uh, DNA and RNA as well. So you have the concept then, by Darwin, of the primordial soup, primordial goo. Well, at the turn of the century, most scientists did not believe in spontaneous generation because it was felt that life was just too complex for it to happen by chance. But the spontaneous generation debate heated up again in uh, 1924 when a Russian biochemist by the name of I.A. Oparin proposed that life had arisen from simpler molecules on the lifeless earth under much different atmospheric conditions than exist today. He proposed that spontaneous generation, life coming from non-life, had occurred gradually over a period of millions and millions of years. In 1929, an English biologist by the name of J.B.S. Haldane proposed that ultraviolet light acting on a primitive atmosphere containing water, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen produced oceans with the consistency of what he called a hot, dilute soup containing the building blocks of life. Now, Haldane and Oparin knew that life could not arise spontaneously with the atmosphere that we have today. And the reason is oxygen. Oxygen is very destructive to the building blocks of life. If you take oxygen and you expose oxygen to proteins or to the building blocks of DNA, it destroys them, it oxidizes them, and they become useless for the production of living systems. And so O'Parent and Haldane proposed that life had occurred spontaneously under very different atmospheric conditions. They said that there was methane, CH4, ammonia, NH4, water, probably some carbon dioxide, as well as hydrogen gas, but no oxygen, because oxygen devastates the possibility of spontaneous generation. It wasn't until 1953 that their theory was put to the test. In 1953, a graduate student named Stanley Miller, was challenged by his professor, Harold Urey, to test the oparin haldane hypothesis. And so what he did was he created a system of glass flasks in which he circulated ammonia, methane, water, and hydrogen, circulated it through this system of glass flasks. There was no oxygen in there, however. And he developed a certain part of the glass flask where he had a spark, two metal electrodes, and he was able to create a spark between the electrodes to electrify these gases. After about a week, he noticed that the mixture turned kind of a cloudy, reddish color. He analyzed the mixture, and to his amazement, he was able to produce some of the building blocks 
of living systems by this random molecular spark and soup experiment, as it's called. But when we look at the products of Miller's experiment, we find an interesting mix. 85% of what Miller made was tar. The same stuff that the roofer used today to repair some cracked tiles on my roof. Tar. Black, gooey stuff. 13% consisted of carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids are very complex carbon, oxygen, hydrogen containing chemicals, but most of them are not used in living systems. 1.05% of what he produced was glycine, one of the amino acids, one of the 20 amino acids found in living systems. And 0.85% was alanine, another amino acid that he made. Eventually, it was discovered that he produced a very small trace amounts of aspartic acid, glutamic acid, and beta alanine, and a few other amino acids that are found in living systems. When Miller did this experiment, it was hailed as proof that random chemistry can produce living systems. I teach at the Calvary Chapel Bible College, and recently I was teaching up there, and one of the students came up afterwards and said to me, isn't it true that some guy in 1953 produced life in a test tube (laughs) by sparking it? And of course, Stanley Miller did not. But it was amazing to me how effectively students have been brainwashed into believing that this experiment was virtual proof that living systems can be produced by chance chemistry. Let's look at some claims by some chemists about the significance of the Miller-Urey experiment. Robert Shapiro, a PhD biochemist from New York University, wrote a book called Origins, A Skeptic's Guide to the Creation of Life on Earth in 1986. And on page 105, he said this. He said, let us sum up. The experiment performed by Miller yielded tar as its most abundant product. There are about 50 small organic compounds that are called building blocks of life. Only two of these 50 occurred among the preferential Miller-Urey products. So two of the 50 chemicals necessary to build an amoeba, a single-celled organism, actually occurred inside the Miller-Urey experiment in significant amounts. When I was in college, I was told that other experimenters after Miller and Urey did this experiment, were able to produce the building blocks of DNA, the nucleotides that I showed you earlier. I was told that it had been done. In fact, in my biochemistry textbook that I used in medical school, in the introduction, it spoke about the origin of life, that biochemists had actually been able to do this in the laboratory. Using spark and soup type experiments, they'd been able to produce the nucleotides, the building blocks of the DNA molecule. Well, in 1986, Robert Shapiro comments on this. And he says, regarding the nucleotides of DNA and RNA, he said they have never been reported in any amount in such spark and soup type experiments. Yet a mythology has emerged that maintains the opposite. I have seen several statements in scientific sources which claim that proteins and nucleic acids themselves have been prepared. These errors reflect the operation of an entire belief system. The facts do not support this belief. Such thoughts may be comforting, but they run far ahead of any experimental validation. Now, what he's saying is, is that the letters of the genetic code, the nucleotides that make up the DNA molecule, have never been produced, ever in any spark or soup type experiments. So if you can't produce the letters, how are you going to produce the book? It's not going to happen. And indeed, subsequent studies since then have not been able to produce any evidence of nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA. Well, let's look at some other problems with the Miller-Urey experiment. Number one, there is no geochemical evidence for the primordial soup. The only place that you will find the primordial soup on planet Earth is in biology textbooks. It does not exist in the rocks. There is no geochemical evidence in the ancient rocks on planet Earth that any primordial soup ever existed. Michael Denton, a molecular biologist, wrote in his book, Evolution of Theory and Crisis, in 1986, he said this. He said, considering the way the prebiotic soup is referred to in so many discussions of the origin of life as an already established reality, it comes as something of a shock to realize that there is absolutely no positive evidence for its existence. It's purely theoretical. 
Secondly, remember I mentioned to you that O'Perrin and Haldane said that the ancient atmosphere did not have any oxygen? And the reason they say it didn't have any oxygen is because you can't have oxygen and have intact building blocks of DNA and RNA. Well, recently, since the 1970s, especially since some studies done by Apollo 16 astronauts, there's been abundant evidence that's come out that's proven that the early atmosphere did have oxygen. Michael Denton, in his book, Evolution of Theory and Crisis, on page 61, said this. He said, Ominously, for believers in the traditional organic soup scenario, there is no clear geochemical evidence to exclude the possibility that oxygen was present in the early Earth's atmosphere, soon after the formation of its crust. In the 1970s, it was discovered that water vapor in the upper atmosphere is broken by ultraviolet radiation to produce hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Oxygen gas is what we're breathing. 21% of what we're breathing right now is oxygen gas. And this process called photodissociation is a very efficient process. And it was accomplished uh, in the upper atmosphere. And scientists believe now that this is a very efficient process for the production of oxygen. So there's no evidence for the primordial soup. And there's no evidence that there was an oxygen-free atmosphere in the early atmosphere. And this oxygen problem proposes an interesting uh, problem as well with regards to the survival of living systems. If there was no oxygen on the early atmosphere, then there would be no ozone layer as well. Ozone is a chemical, three oxygen molecules bonded together, which exists in the upper atmosphere, and ozone blocks ultraviolet radiation from reaching the Earth. And this is important because if there was no ozone layer, every living system would eventually die from exposure to intense ultraviolet radiation. So if you do not have oxygen in the early atmosphere, then you also have no ozone, which means the entire Earth would be bombarded by severe ultraviolet radiation. Now, ultraviolet radiation is very destructive to, guess what? Amino acids and nucleotides. If you have no oxygen, then the amino acids and the nucleotides, which are the building blocks of proteins and DNA, will be wiped out by ultraviolet radiation. Michael Denton comments on this. He says, what we have is sort of a catch-22 situation. If we have oxygen, we have no organic compounds, the building blocks of life. But if we don't, we have none either. You see, if you've got oxygen in the atmosphere, then the building blocks made by the spark and soup are going to be wiped out by the oxygen. But if you don't have oxygen, the building blocks are going to be wiped out by ultraviolet radiation. And scientists are beginning to recognize what a problem this is for the traditional spark and soup worldview. Another problem. Remember I mentioned that the O'Perrin, Haldane, Miller, Urey paradigm says that the atmosphere consisted of a large quantities of ammonia and methane. Ammonia and methane are fairly simple molecules, but they're absolutely necessary for the production of amino acids because they contain ammonia, carbon, and hydrogen. And it was assumed that the ancient atmosphere contained large quantities of ammonia and methane. But in the 1970s, atmospheric scientists concluded that ammonia would last only a few thousand years due to exposure to ultraviolet light. You see, with no oxygen in the early atmosphere, the ammonia gets wiped out by the ultraviolet radiation as well. They also concluded that methane, CH4, exposed to ultraviolet radiation would eventually produce a layer of oil 10 meters thick all over planet Earth. So if you can imagine the entire planet Earth being covered with 10 meters thick of oil, it would be a rather gooey environment for life to arise. And that methane uh, is turned into the oil by destruction from ultraviolet light as well. So, you can't have oxygen, but there's abundant evidence that oxygen did exist. There's no methane left after a few thousand years, and there's no ammonia left after a few thousand years. Joel Levine and Tommy Augustin, writing in a journal, Origins of Life, Volume 12, in 1982, said this. They are uh, atmospheric scientists for NASA. They said, the methane and ammonia-dominated atmosphere would have been very short-lived if it ever existed at all. Now, that's a problem because ammonia and methane are absolutely necessary to produce the building blocks of proteins and DNA and RNA. Now, another problem with the 
Miller-Urey experiment that is seldom discussed is the fact that the solution, the yellowy, cloudy solution that Stanley Miller produced is extremely poisonous to living systems. Had Stanley Miller drunk the solution, he would have never been able to publish the paper that he wrote. (laughs) Because the chemicals, the tar and the carboxylic acids found inside his solution are extremely toxic to cells and to enzymes, which are the proteins that accomplish all of the metabolic functions of your body. Everything from vision, digestion, hearing, taste, everything is accomplished by enzymes. And the chemicals produced... The vast majority of the chemicals produced by him are toxic to living systems. So how are you going to get the origin of life in an environment which is equivalent to the kinds of environments that the government is spending millions of dollars to clean up with Superfund? Another interesting problem is that amino acids and nucleotides, the building blocks of proteins and DNA respectively, bond to the chemical junk made in the Miller-Urey experiment far more readily than they bond to each other. Far more readily. The chemical reactions involved in combining amino acids to produce proteins and nucleotides to produce DNA are not simple chemical reactions to accomplish. They are reactions which are called endothermic reactions for you chemists in the audience, requiring tremendous energy to accomplish. However, Amino acids and nucleotides can bond with all that chemical junk, the carboxylic acids, very readily. And when they do that, it wipes them out. They become incapable of then forming life. Now, the next problem for the Miller-Urey experiment is something that was never explained to me in college, in medical school. And one of was one of those lightning bolt points that A.E. Wildersmith struck me with on that tape. And that is that the building blocks of life occur in two forms, right and left-handed. When we look at the amino acids found in living systems, amino acids are very complex molecules that have a three-dimensional structure. And amino acids occur in two forms, left and right-handed forms. And they are mirror images of each other. A left-handed amino acid, if held up to a mirror, the reflection will look as though it's a right-handed amino acid. Now, when Miller and Urey made amino acids in their spark and soup experiment, they produced equal portions, 50-50, of left and right-handed amino acids. Equal portions. Now, there's a serious problem with that, and that is that all the proteins in living systems are made of 100% left-handed amino acids. So if you can imagine a primordial soup with left and right-handed amino acids floating in there, how are you going to get, by random chance, by random combining of the amino acids, production of living systems which contain exclusively one type, only left-handed amino acids? It's a mathematical impossibility. It is absolutely impossible. The building blocks of DNA and RNA called nucleotides are made of 100% right-handed nucleotides. Again, from a primordial soup, if they could make them, which they haven't, as I mentioned before, you would not expect to reach in every time and grab out a right-handed nucleotide. Eventually, you're going to pull in a left-handed one, and it's going to destroy the structure of the DNA molecule. Now, this problem is so huge that a symposium was held in the early 1980s to figure out how in the world could living systems, which consist of 100% left-handed proteins and 100% right-handed nucleotides, or uh, DNA, have come out of a primordial goo which would have contained 50% left and 50% right-handed building blocks. And it was determined at this symposium that it's impossible, that chance chemistry cannot explain it. We'll return to that in a little bit. I want to just point out a couple things about protein and DNA. Proteins are, as I said, long chains of amino acids. And proteins are built by adding one amino acid at a time onto an ever-lengthening chain. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is built by adding one nucleotide at a time to an ever-lengthening chain as well. If you had a primordial soup consisting of 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed 
building blocks, the only kind of DNA and proteins that would come out of such a primordial soup would be DNA and proteins containing 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed building blocks using chance chemistry. That's the only result. If even one right-handed amino acid is inserted into the structure of a protein, it can completely destroy its ability to function. And that is why this problem is so huge to the origin of life issue. So the question is, how did we end up with proteins consisting of 100% left-handed amino acids and DNA consisting of 100% right-handed nucleotides? Chance chemistry will never produce such a mixture of 100% purity from a primordial goo which contains 50-50 left and right-handed building blocks. So how did it happen? The only way to separate the right and the left-handed amino acids and to make sure that every time you reach into the bucket to pull out a building block, that you pull out the left-handed amino acids only. The only way to do that is by the introduction of biochemical expertise. Chance chemistry will never do it. This has been studied intensively. If you want to read about this, you can read A.E. Wildersmith's books. One of the best books he's ever written, The Natural Sciences Knows Nothing of Evolution. He discusses this in great detail. The only way to separate and get out the pure building blocks for the production of life is with the introduction of biochemical expertise. And biochemical expertise comes only from a mind. Expertise, know-how, is the opposite of chance. And the only mechanism known to separate them is with biochemical expertise. Now, there's another problem that is devastating to the spontaneous generation concept, and that is something called the law of mass action. It's very simple to understand. And this is something that will absolutely derail anyone if you discuss with them the issue of the origin of life. When you take an amino acid and combine it, chemically combine it, to another amino acid, you produce something called a dipeptide, which is a baby protein, and you produce a molecule of water. Now that reaction is reversible. The molecule of water can combine with the dipeptide and it can go back to being two unbonded amino acids. Same thing for nucleotides. You combine a nucleotide to a nucleotide and you produce a dinucleotide and a molecule of water. Now there is a law called the law of mass action. It's a law of chemistry which says that a reversible chemical reaction, a reaction that goes in both directions, will never go in the direction to produce something which already exists in excess amounts. Now, question, what is the number one most abundant chemical in the primordial soup? Water. Now, that means that water is going to drive the reaction not towards the right, it's going to drive it to the left, so that the vast majority of the building blocks, the amino acids and the nucleotides, will be unbonded. The law of mass action says that the reaction will never go to the right towards the production, the net production of proteins and DNA in a watery environment. So for those that propose that life arose in a watery environment by chance, they have chosen the worst possible environment on the planet because water drives the chemical reaction the other way. If you take protein, pure protein, and stick it in water, you know what it does? The water molecule breaks up the protein. If you take DNA or RNA and put it in pure water, the water molecules break up the DNA and the RNA and drive it to unbonded nucleotides. Now, this relates to another problem, problem of chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium is something that we all can easily understand if you just think of a couple of simple illustrations. If you take a bucket of clear water and you put a drop of red dye into the bucket, that red dye will disperse over time and become very dilute. You wouldn't expect the red dye to stay as a little drop of red dye in some corner of the bucket. That doesn't happen. The red dye disperses until chemical equilibrium occurs where the dye is evenly distributed throughout the bucket. That's the concept of equilibrium. Well, if you take amino acids, the building blocks of protein and nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA, and put them in water, what happens? 
Well, it turns out that the amino acids will combine and uncombine and combine and uncombine. Every once in a while, you'll get two amino acids that are bonded together. Sometimes you'll get three or four that are bonded together, but the water molecules keep breaking it up. And when you look at the solution, when it's at a state of equilibrium, once everything's been smoothed out and equalized inside the uh, solution, that 1% of the amino acids will exist as dipeptides, which is two amino acids bonded together. 0.01% exist as tripeptides, three amino acids bonded together, and less than 1 in 10 to the minus 20th will exist in a chain of 10 amino acids. Now this is a problem, because the smallest proteins in living systems are somewhere between 70 and 100 amino acids long. And yet in a watery solution, you'll never get concentrations of amino acids forming long chains in a watery solution. It just does not happen. And that's because water drives the equation to the opposite direction in chemical equilibrium, which is the force, it's related to the second law of thermodynamics, drives these chemical reactions the direction to produce not long chains required to produce life, but to produce randomly floating building blocks in the watery environment. Harold Blum, in the 1950s, was one of the very first scientists to recognize this problem. He recognized that a watery solution of amino acids and nucleotides, if left for millions and millions and millions of years, addition of large amounts of time does not organize the amino acids and the nucleotides to form long chains. It actually drives it towards equilibrium. And at equilibrium, the vast majority are unbonded. And in his book, Time's Arrow and Evolution, Harold Blum said this, page 178. He said, one may take the view that the greater the time elapsed, the greater should be the approach to equilibrium, which is the most probable state. And it seems that this ought to take precedence in our thinking over the idea that time provides the possibility for the occurrence of the highly improbable. In other words, long time periods does not increase the probability that chemicals which don't like to bond to each other anyway, will bond to each other and form long chains. In fact, he says it's the opposite. That time is the enemy of spontaneous generation. The more time you have, the more likely the solution is going to exist in unbonded chemicals. Now let's look next at the uh, odds, the mathematical odds of the origin of life. A number of people have calculated the mathematical probability of the spontaneous generation of living systems. Harold Morowitz from Yale University wrote a book in 1968 called Energy Flow in Biology. And in his book, he calculated that if you had a primordial goo with all the necessary chemicals to form a single amoeba, a bacteria, the chance that those chemicals would come together by chance to form an amoeba is one chance in 10 to the 100 billionth power. That's a one with 100 billion zeros after it. Sir Frederick Hoyle, a British astronomer, well known for his anti-evolution views, although he is an atheist. He is an atheist. He despises Christianity, and he despises creationists, and he despises people like me who continually quote him. (laughs) In the late 1970s, in the early 80s, he and some graduate student colleagues tried to calculate the probability of the origin of life. And he said in Nature in 1981, volume 294, that the likelihood of the formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number with 40,000 knots or zeros after it. It is enough to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. If the beginnings of life were not random, they must therefore have been the product of purposeful intelligence. He also said in 1981 in Nature that the chance that higher life forms might have emerged in this way by random chance is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard could assemble a Boeing 747 from the material therein. Now let's think about the odds that Hoyle and Morowitz came up with. Consider that to win the state lottery you have about a chance of 1 in 10 million or 1 in 10 to the 7th power chance to win the state lottery. The odds of winning the state lottery every single week of your life 
from age 18 to age 99 is one chance in 4.6 times 10 to the 29,120th power. It's not likely, is it? (laughs) Now, one chance, you can scratch off the 4.6 there just for mathematical ease. One chance in 10 to the 29,000th power, roughly, the chances of you winning the state lottery every week of your life from age 18 to age 99. Now, mathematicians tell us that any event that has a probability that is less than one chance in 10 to the 50th power is a miracle. Anything that is less likely than one chance in 10 to the 50th power is a miracle. Morowitz determined that the spontaneous generation of life is one chance in 10 to the 100 billionth power. And Hoyle said it was one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. Fred Hoyle, when he did his study, though, he only calculated the probability of the origin of just the proteins within an amoeba. He didn't get in, even get into the DNA, the RNA, and the cell wall. So he didn't calculate the whole thing. He had so many zeros, he knew that it was impossible. He didn't continue. Now, George Wald, a biochemist from Harvard University and winner of the Nobel Prize in Biology, said in The Origin of Life in uh, 1955, one has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task, that is, spontaneous generation, to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet, we are here as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. (laughs) The chemistry to produce life by random chance is impossible. And the scientific community has admitted it. And yet, as he says, have faith, brother. I believe (laughs) that I'm the result of spontaneous generation. Francis Crick, in 1981, in his book, Life Itself, Its Origin and Its Nature, said on page 88, An honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. He says it's almost a miracle. So let's summarize where we've gotten to this point. First of all, there is no evidence for the primordial soup. Secondly, there is no evidence for an atmosphere containing no oxygen. Third, the methane, ammonia, and hydrogen atmosphere would have lasted only a few thousand years. I forgot to mention about hydrogen. Hydrogen is so light that scientists have calculated that hydrogen would have evaporated and left the atmosphere after just a few thousand years on the early atmosphere. Fourthly, the building blocks of life would be predominantly unbonded in a watery environment not bonded together in long chains, but unbonded, driven that way because water molecules break the bonds and equilibrium drives the solution to be very dilute and unbonded building blocks and not products. Next, because the building blocks of life occur in right and left-handed forms, any proteins or DNA made from a primordial soup would contain equal portions of right and left-handed building blocks. Those types of DNA and proteins are called racemic, meaning they consist of equal portions of right and left-handed building blocks, and they are perfectly incapable of forming life, absolutely incapable of forming life. And scientists know this, because if you've got right and left-handed building blocks in there, they will not form the nice, beautiful three-dimensional structures like the DNA molecule, the double spiral helix, and proteins will not form nice three-dimensional structures necessary to form enzymes, which are so important in living systems. And the mathematical odds of producing pure left-handed proteins and pure right-handed DNA is in the realm of the miraculous, according to the biologists. Now let's talk about the origin of the software. Living systems contain not only chemical hardware, but they contain software. Just like a computer contains hardware, the monitor, the box, the hard drive, they also contain software. When I bought my first computer, I was all excited. I got it out of the box. I put the computer on the desk. I plugged it in. It was a Macintosh. And I hit the on switch, and I was waiting, and I waited, and I waited, and this disk picture came up with a question mark. And it just sat there. It didn't give me the little happy face that I was waiting for. (laughs) 
I just sat there and I thought, what's wrong? It's broken. I just bought it. Well, I had a beautiful piece of hardware, but the problem was, was the hard drive inside the computer had no software. It had not been formatted yet. And so a computer consisting of fantastic hardware is of no good unless it's filled with information. Then I got the manual out and it told me that it wouldn't run unless I filled it with software. So I then had to format the hard drive and put system uh, folder, etc. on there and it functioned fine and I get the little happy Mac, no problem when I started up. But it took the addition of software, which is information, to the computer before it would run. And the same is true for living systems. I've just shown you for the last several minutes that the chemical hardware which makes up living systems cannot arise by random chance in a primordial goo on planet Earth. It just cannot happen. But for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to give it to you free. Three billion years ago, the oceans were filled with proteins and DNA molecules and RNA molecules all over the place. Now the question is, would spontaneously derived DNA and proteins, would it have any information on it? And the answer is no. There would be no intrinsic information on a DNA molecule that was arisen by spontaneous chemistry, and I'll show you why in a minute. As I mentioned before, the genetic code, which is the language convention that accomplishes the storage and retrieval of information on the DNA molecule, is a digital code. By saying digital, I mean that it can be described in mathematical terms. I mentioned to you that the genetic code is error correcting. I mentioned to you the genetic code is redundant, like this slide. <laughs> and the information is overlapping. Now let's talk a little bit about the amount of information in a fertilized human egg. A fertilized human egg is about the size of a pinhead. It contains enough information to fill 1,000 books over 500 pages thick with print so small you would need a microscope to read it. It's estimated that it's around 6 to 10 billion nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA, are found in a fertilized egg. If you took all the chemical letters, the nucleotides, found in every cell in your body and you printed them in books, you would produce enough books to fill the entire Grand Canyon 50 times. You have 100 trillion cells from head to toe, give or take a couple of billion. And the information found in all those cells, if printed in books, would fill the Grand Canyon 50 times. That's how much information is found in a fertilized egg the size of a pinhead. Now let's talk about the origin of information. When we talk about information, we're talking about language systems. Tonight I'm talking to you in the English language. Those of you that understand these noises coming out of my mouth, understand it because you were taught a language system or convention called the English language. Language conventions are always the result of intelligent design or intelligent contrivance. And let me show you some examples why. If I were to draw on a board a series of dots and dashes, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 many of you would know that that means SOS. SOS, the universal distress signal, you'd know that Dr. Eastman has a flat tire and uh, needs help. Now those of you that don't know the Morse code would look at those dots and you'd say, you know, that looks like a highly unlikely pattern, but I haven't got a clue what that means. And so you'd look at the pattern and you'd see that there is some order to it, but no information is conveyed unless you have a knowledge of the language convention called the Morse code. Now, the Morse code was devised first. The system the, of rules and regulations that governs the meaning of the dots and dashes had to be developed first before the dots and the dashes could have any meaning. Do you see where I'm going with this? 
You have to develop the language convention first, the rules and the regulations first, before the dots and the dashes can have any meaning. If I told you that I was going to give you a G-I-F-T, you'd be very happy, because a gift in English means that I'm going to give you a present. The English language defines the letters gift, G-I-F-T, as meaning a present, something pleasant in the English language. However, if you're German, and I say I'm going to give you a G-I-F-T, you probably won't like me, (laughs) because G-I-F-T in German is a poison. So the sequence of the letters themselves don't have any meaning. You hang meaning on the sequences. You create a language convention, which you use then to interpret the sequences. So spontaneously derived DNA with a sequence of nucleotides would have no meaning, no information, unless you had a language convention by which to interpret the sequences. When we look at a book, or when we look at a floppy disk, or we look at the molecules in the DNA molecule, the uh, nucleotides, they don't have any intrinsic meaning to them. When you look at the letter A or the letter B, no information is really conveyed to you when you look at the shape of the letters or when you look at the iron atoms in a floppy disk. However, the letters in a book, iron atoms in a floppy disk, molecules in the DNA can carry meaning when they are used based on a pre-existing language convention. The meaning of a sequence of letters, the meaning of a sequence of beads on a string, knots on a rope, and the meaning of the sounds of my voice or any storage system is determined by the rules and regulations of a pre-existing language convention. And language conventions are always the result of intelligent contrivance. Pastor Chuck when he goes up to camp, likes to tell the story. He says, uh, let's say we're going to develop a language. Ug means let's go to the malt shop and have a chocolate malt. Nug means, okay, I'll meet you there. And lug means I'm buying. Okay? Now, if you know the rules of that convention, that little language convention, and I say, ug, and you say, nug, and I say, lug. Then you know that you and I are going to the malt shop, and I'm buying, and you're pretty happy, and you're going to meet me there. <laughs> but if you didn't happen to hear that part of the meeting, and you walk in right now, and you hear me saying, ug, nug, lug, the likelihood is you're going to think I'm a lunatic, okay? <laughs> and it's because the sounds coming out of my mouth have no meaning unless they're interpreted by a pre-existing language convention. So language conventions have to be devised first, and you use those to interpret the sequences of letters, beads on a string, knots on a rope, nucleotides on a chain, iron atoms on a floppy disk, etc., etc., etc. So language conventions are always the result of intelligent contrivance, and that means that language conventions are always the result of a mind and never the result of chance. Now, when I do presentations like this, I'm often confronted with the issue of, well, what about millions and millions and millions of years? If we had millions and millions or billions or trillions of years, couldn't we produce the DNA molecules and the genetic code by chance? I'm often confronted with that. Well, this issue was the topic of the great debate in 1860, June 30th, 1860, between Bishop Wilberforce and Thomas Huxley at the Oxford Union. It's one of the most famous debates that has ever occurred. And in this debate, they debated the notion of the origin of life and the origin of information found in living systems. Bishop Wilberforce, a mathematician and a very knowledgeable scientist, argued that when you look at living systems, you see evidence of design. And where there is design, there must be a designer. He was using Paley's watchmaker argument. If you find a watch, you know there's a watchmaker. If you see design, you know there's a designer. Thomas Huxley got up and said, I'd like to ask for several assumptions to be given to me. And Bishop Wilberforce said, that's fine. He said, I'd like to have six monkeys that will never die. He said, fine. I'd like to have six typewriters that will never break down. He said, fine, and I'd like to have an unlimited supply 
of paper and ink. Wilberforce said, fine, I'll give it to you. And Huxley then argued that if these monkeys start typing away on the typewriter, that eventually they will produce all the works of Shakespeare, the Psalms of David, and indeed all of the books found in the libraries in England by random chance, if the monkeys are given an infinite amount of time. This is the famous monkey at the Macintosh computer argument. (laughs) Huxley argued, based on the mathematical probability formula, that if time is infinite, then according to the probability formula, if t equals infinity, then the probability of any event occurring is 1, or 100%. So using the law of mathematical probability, he was able to show, indeed accurately, that the typewriters that Huxley's monkeys used would indeed produce, if given an infinite amount of time, would indeed produce the Bible and all the writings and all the libraries by random strumming. Wilberforce lost the debate, and according to A.E. Waldersmith, never debated on this topic again. Well, about 115 years later, A.E. Waldersmith discovered the flaw in the great debate. A.E. Waldersmith, by the way, has, in his career, came up with concepts in chemistry which, had he not been a Christian, he would have won the Nobel Prize. A gentleman who came up with some concepts that Waldersmith had come up with about 10 to 15 years earlier eventually won the Nobel Prize. But because he was a creationist, he was shunned in, uh, in Europe. Well. Let me tell you what the flaw is in the monkey and the typewriter argument. It's very simple. When the monkey hits the key on the typewriter, the ink from the monkey's typewriter is placed on the paper permanently. Chemical reactions in biology do not work in the same way. When Huxley's monkey hit the key and put the paper on there irreversibly, That was not a true representation of biological reactions. As I mentioned to you before, biological reactions type in, that is, amino acid plus an amino acid bonds to form protein, but they also type out. They go the other direction as well. Now, the interesting thing about biochemical reactions is that they type out or unbond far more readily than they bond. Huxley's monkeys, when they put those letters on the page, They only typed in. And they produced what are called stable end products, long chains of DNA and proteins, which did not break down. And so it was not an accurate representation of what occurs in living systems. And a more representative typewriter that would truly represent living systems would be a typewriter which types in. A signal goes from the monkey's brain down its hand, into the finger, the monkey hits the key, and the ink is put onto the paper. As soon as the monkey lets go, the ink jumps off of the paper, goes back to the typewriter hammer, back up into the monkey's brain. It types in, and it types out. Amino acids combine, and then they uncombine, and they combine, and they uncombine. And in a chemical primordial goo, they uncombine or type out much more readily than they type in. So the monkey and the typewriter analogy is only valid if the typewriter types in and types out with equal facility. And there, of course, is no typewriter that does that. Now, that means that after 5 billion years or 100 billion years of typing, Huxley's monkeys will have typed just as much as if they'd been typing only for 30 seconds. Because the ink goes on the page, and then it goes off the page. It goes on the page, and then off the page. On the page, off the page. Five billion years of doing that, you've still got reams and reams and reams of blank paper. Because they type in and they type out. And that is the error in the monkey and the typewriter argument. The typewriter is not an accurate representation of biochemical reactions because they unbond or type out with greater facility than they type in. And the next problem is, how far would a monkey get if every other letter is potentially lethal? 
Remember I mentioned to you that the primordial goo consists of 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed building blocks? If you take and you add right-handed amino acids to proteins, it destroys the structure in many cases of the protein, resulting in a non-functional protein which can be lethal to organisms. So every other keystroke that the monkeys are hitting would be right-handed amino acids and a left-handed amino acid, potentially. Statistically, they'd be hitting right and left-handed amino acids, and every other keystroke would be lethal to the genetic code or the organism's genetic code that they are supposedly typing. So how far do you think they're going to get? Not very far. Frederick Hoyle commented on the monkey and the typewriter argument, and he said this. No matter how large the environment one considers, life cannot have had a random beginning. Troops of monkeys thundering away at random on typewriters could not produce the works of Shakespeare for the practical reason that the whole observable universe is not large enough to contain the necessary monkey hordes, the necessary typewriters, and the, certainly the waste paper baskets required for the deposition of the wrong attempts. The same is true for living material. He said that in his book, Evolution from Space, A Theory of Cosmic Creationism, in 1981. Now, commenting on the origin of genetic information, the information that is stored on the DNA molecule, he said this. He said, from the beginning of this book, we have emphasized the enormous information content of even the simplest living systems. The information that is on living systems cannot, in our view, be generated by what are often called natural processes i.e. random chemistry, as for instance through meteorological and chemical processes occurring at the surface of a lifeless planet. Then he says this, as well as or in addition to a suitable physical and chemical environment, a large initial store of information was also needed for the origin of life. And we have argued that the requisite information to create life came from an intelligence. That's in his book, Evolution from Space, A Theory of Cosmic Creationism, in 1981, page 150. So he says that the monkey and typewriter argument is bogus. There's not enough time, there's not enough space in the universe to store all the typewriters and the waste paper. And he says the genetic code comes from an intelligence. The information stored on living systems had to come from an intelligence. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Now the next question is this. The information stored in the DNA molecule is required to produce all the proteins on planet Earth and the DNA and the RNA. But you can't produce DNA until you've got proteins. So it's a chicken and the egg thing. Which came first, the protein or the DNA? John Walton, in his book Organization and the Origin of Life in 1977, commented on this problem. He said, genes which are the segments of DNA where information is stored to produce uh, proteins. He said genes and enzymes, enzymes again are proteins, are linked together in a living cell. Two interlocked systems, each supporting the other. It is difficult to see how either could manage alone. Yet, if we are to avoid invoking either a creator or a very large improbability, we must accept that one occurred before the other in the origin of life. But which one was it? We are left with the ancient riddle, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Actually, that was Robert Shapiro, excuse me, in um, his book, Origins, in 1986. A little technical difficulty here. John Walton, in 1977, uh, said this, The origin of the genetic code presents formidable unsolved problems. The coded information in the nucleotide sequence is meaningless without the translation machinery. But the specification of this machinery is itself coded in the DNA. Thus, without the machinery, the information is meaningless. But without the coded information, the machinery cannot be produced. This presents a paradox of the chicken and egg variety, and attempts to solve it so far have been sterile. He says that the information on the DNA molecule necessary to produce proteins cannot be extracted from the DNA molecule because the DNA molecule, to get the information off the DNA molecule, requires proteins. But you don't have proteins until you have DNA, and you don't have DNA until you have proteins. So it's a chicken and the egg scenario. So in summary, let's talk about the origin of the software here. Randomly produced sequences of DNA, letters, beads on a string, etc., can carry information, but they do not possess any intrinsic information. 
Information depends on a pre-existing language convention. You must have a system of rules and regulations in place first, which you use to interpret sequences of letters, beads on a string, or DNA uh, nucleotides before such strings of uh, building blocks can have any meaning. Language systems are always the result of intelligent contrivance and design. Now, faced with this interesting problem, the fact that the origin of the hardware is mathematically impossible and the origin of the genetic code requires, as Fred Hoyle said, it requires an intelligence, you might expect that Fred Hoyle and others would have concluded, well, there has to be a god. They determine that the laws of chemistry, and physics, and biology on planet Earth are insufficient to explain the origin of life on planet Earth. And so they concluded that the source of life had to be an extraterrestrial source. So you might think, well, that means these guys came to the conclusion that God did it, correct? Not at all. In the 1970s, Francis Crick, winner of the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the DNA molecule, proposed a new theory called directed panspermia. He proposed that the first life forms were delivered here by extraterrestrials, and they've been watching our evolutionary progress ever since. And Fred Hoyle and others made similar assertions in the early 1980s. You see, the choice was random chance to explain life. Well, that doesn't work. They knew that. God? Well, we don't really like that. Or how about E.T.? So they chose E.T. They concluded that the information in the DNA molecule, which was the result of an intelligence, was an extraterrestrial intelligence, but not an extra-dimensional intelligence. And they actually proposed that life had arisen on planet Earth, that spaceships flew over, sprinkled little amoebas into the ocean four billion years ago, and they've been visiting us ever since to watch our progress. Indeed, when you look at the culture we live in today, there is a tremendous amount of fascination with UFOs. In the 1970s, the United States spent millions of dollars to send probes to Mars looking for evidence of life. And some were looking for evidence of extraterrestrials on Mars. That's the uh, 1976 Mariner probe. But indeed, when they got to Mars, they did not find any evidence of chemical evolution or the building blocks of life anywhere in their chemical analysis. Some people said, well, man, we can't really propose that ETs did it. I mean, come on, we're going to become laughingstocks if we do that. So others have proposed that the building blocks of life, perhaps microbes, living bacteria, were transported to planet Earth by comets or interstellar dust or interstellar rocks billions of years ago, and they landed in the ocean, and we've been the product of evolution ever since then. In fact, Time Magazine recently did a story about how life began. I believe this was in uh, 1993. And they said that the Earth was bombarded heavily by meteors and comets, and that some of the building blocks of life were actually delivered to Earth in that manner and that those life forms gradually evolved over a period of billions of years into the current life forms we see today. Well, Michael Denton, in his book, Evolution, A Theory, and Crisis, in 1986, said this. Nothing illustrates more clearly just how intractable a problem the origin of life has become than the fact that world authorities can seriously toy with the idea of panspermia. You see, they had a choice. The God called Chance transcendent creator God or E.T. They knew that chance can't produce life. They didn't want to admit that God did it, so they chose E.T. This is interesting. Well, my question is, who made E.T.? <laughs> well, let's say, well, you see, E.T. came from a population a planet that was sprinkled by a previous population there. Okay. So E.T. evolved from primordial goo as well. Well, who made the guys that sprinkled them? Well, they were sprinkled by a previous population. Well, who made them? Well, a previous population sprinkled them. So you have this infinite regression back in time of sprinklings. Okay. Where aliens are flying around the universe, 
sprinkling little things like amoebas into the water that eventually evolve into creatures which then go on to sprinkle their seeds in other planets. So eventually we are going to produce spaceships and we're going to go sprinkle a planet somewhere and we will become the ETs for some future primordial goo. But there's a problem. We still have to get down to the question of where and how did the information in the first living systems come from within the domain of our universe? In the first tape of this two-tape series, Chuck Missler talked about the fact that one of the most amazing discoveries in the 20th century is the fact that the universe is finite, that time and space and matter had a beginning. And so you don't have an infinite amount of time going backwards. You've got a limited amount of time. Time is not eternal in the past. And so you still have to get around to explaining, well, where did the original information come from in those ETs if we came from ETs? And that problem of the origin of information has not been adequately tackled by science today. If we are to assume that if, in fact, life on Earth cannot arise by chance, why then would we assume that life can arise by chance somewhere else in the universe? If we believe that we're the product of E.T., and that E.T., of ultimately the first life forms out there in the universe, arose by chance, then we have to assume that somewhere else in the universe, the laws of chemistry and the laws of physics are different than they are on planet Earth. And there's not a shred of evidence for that. And indeed, appealing to that is equal to an appeal to the supernatural. Ernst Haeckel, famous evolutionist in the 19th century, said in his book, The History of Creation, If we do not accept the hypothesis of spontaneous generation, then at this one point in the history of evolution, we must have recourse to the miracle of a supernatural creation. There's only two options, he says, either spontaneous generation or supernatural creation. George Wald, gentleman I quoted earlier, he said, When it comes to the origin of life, there are only two possibilities, creation or spontaneous generation. There is no third way. Spontaneous generation was disproved 100 years ago, but that leads us to only one other conclusion, that of supernatural creation. We cannot accept that on philosophical grounds. Therefore, we choose to believe the impossible that life arose spontaneously by chance. Now, he didn't say that the origin of life is scientifically unacceptable. He said it's philosophically unacceptable. He said supernatural creation is philosophically unacceptable to me. Therefore, I'm going to choose to believe that it happened by chance, which is impossible. It's philosophically unacceptable to him, is what he said. Now, if it can't happen by chance... And if we don't want to invoke E.T., then our only other option is a transcendent creator. A creator who existed outside of the dimensions of Earth, and a creator who existed before the creation of the space-time domain. What would be the attributes of such a creator? A creator who is transcendent, who exists outside of time and space, and yet is able to manifest himself within the dimensions of space and time, must exist before the dimensions of space and time. Such a creator must be able to exist and act simultaneously within and without and outside the space-time domain. And such a being would be outside time and could help tell history in advance. Because a transcendent creator exists outside of space and time, he would be, in effect, able to see the timeline in our universe like we can see the Rose Parade from the Goodyear blimp. You can see the first float, and the last float, and all the floats in between, because you're outside the parade. And that would be the perspective of a transcendent creator. And such a being would also be outside space, and he could therefore pop into the universe anywhere and any time he wished. Those are some of the attributes of a transcendent creator. Interestingly, a transcendent creator would also be outside the aging effects of time in the second law of thermodynamics. I haven't talked about the second law in this session, but the second law of thermodynamics is the law of physics, which says that with the advance of time, the universe is wearing out, decaying, and cooling off. That things are breaking down, wearing out, and falling apart. Chuck discussed that a little bit in the first session. If there is a transcendent creator who exists outside of time and space, he would be outside the effects of the second law, which is the law that drives the building blocks to break apart. 
through the process of equilibrium. That's why Jesus could say, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt. Because outside of the time domain, there is no time. And therefore, the second law, which is the law of decay, which is a time-bound law, does not function. There is no decay in heaven. The second law does not function there. Now, a transcendent being, a being who existed prior to the dimensions of space and time, would also be someone who would not be confined to the universe. Many of the religions on planet Earth believe that the creator is either a product of the universe or that he is confined to this fishbowl we call the universe. Now, the problem is that is not transcendency. A transcendent creator is someone who exists outside of or transcends the dimensions of space and time. And such a being would not be the universe. And only the Bible teaches the notion of a fully transcendent creator and a finite universe. The concept that prior to the existence of space and time, there was a creator who once he made the dimensions of space and time was then able to enter space and time, tinker with the components within the universe, the matter, and ultimately he manifested himself in space and time in the person of Jesus Christ. Fred Hoyle said this amazing quote in one of his books. I don't know how long it's going to be before astronomers generally recognize that the combinatorial arrangement of not even one among the many thousands of biopolymers, that is DNA, RNA, and proteins, on which life depends could have arisen, could be arrived at by natural processes here on Earth. Astronomers will have little difficulty at understanding this because they will be assured by biologists that this is not so. But biologists, having been assured in their turn by others that this is not so, the others are a group of persons who believe quite openly in mathematical miracles. They advocate the belief that tucked away in nature, outside of normal physics, there is a law which performs miracles, provided the miracles are to the aid of biology. This curious situation sits oddly on a profession that for long has been dedicated to coming up with logical explanations of biblical miracles. Fred Hoyle, in an article, The Big Bang in Astronomy, in November 1981, page 526. Now, the Bible teaches that God existed before time. In 2 Timothy 1.9, it says, God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. In Isaiah 57.15, it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God, the Bible says, existed before time and he inhabits eternity, a dimension outside of the space-time domain. And that places him in position to be the one who created the finite universe and the life forms on planet Earth. And the New Testament says that Jesus Christ is the very creator of the universe and the author of life. In John 1, verses 1 through 3 and verse 14, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Romans 10 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Joshua twenty four fifteen, and I'll finish with this verse, says this, And if it seems evil unto you to serve Yahweh the Lord, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day whom you will serve. There's only three options. You can serve the God called chance. The idea that chance produced all the life forms on planet Earth. And that you are the product of a lightning bolt strike in a puddle three billion years ago. And that the information stored in your DNA molecules came about by accident, which it cannot happen, as I've shown you tonight. 
Or you can serve E.T. Buy his movie, sit in front of the TV and bow down (laughs) to the God that created you. Or you can serve the creator beyond time and space, the transcendent one that existed before the dimensions of space and time, the one who spoke life into existence, the one who spoke the universe into existence, the one that, according to Genesis 2-7, made me from dirt. I made you from dirt. That's why we're all, we're all dirt clods. <laughs> so it's your choice. The God called chance, E.T., or the creator beyond time and space.